and I'd like to thank uh, Precision Nanosystems for the opportunity to talk to you about our work. I'm going to focus on talking about these lipid peptide nanocomplexes on our work in lung, so it carries on nicely from the previous speaker where Carla ended. So I run a research group at UCL Institute, Institute of Child Health, and we're very much focused on developing therapies for pediatric diseases, and the focus of uh, a lot of our research is cystic fibrosis. This is a disease I started working on about 20 years ago, and I was, it was my first postdoc, and I was told, gene therapy for CF, it's going to be so easy. All you've got to do is put the gene into a carrier, a lipid, and then breathe it in, and we'll cure the disease. So I was looking forward to my first nature paper. Of course, that's, I'm still waiting. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, what, is, uh, what, what, is the, what is cystic fibrosis? What are the problems about developing treatments? And what is the way forward? That's more what I'm interested in. So just briefly, cystic fibrosis, it's one of the most common autosomal recessive genetic diseases carried on uh, chromosome 7. It encodes uh, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein, and you see the picture of it at the bottom there, cartoon, and it sits in the membrane and the apical surface of cells that line the airway, the of the lung, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles. And what it does is allow the passage of chloride ions and a few other kinds of ions as well, bicarbonate and other halide. So it sounds like it's doing something pretty simple. So how come it causes this uh, uh, drastic disease? So just to recap what's going on in, in, in the lung airways. So the lung is uh, obviously a, a, a barrier to, to the environment, and it's there to, uh, as well as letting air in, it's there to keep out pollutants, bacteria, viruses, etc. And so uh, we've uh, developed, evolved this very sophisticated mucociliary clearance system. So the, as you can see in the cartoon on the left, looking, that's a cross section of the of a trachea, you can see there's the, the surface airway epithelial cells, and then just above that are the, the cilia, and they're waving around, clearing out particles in uh, a watery gel fluid layer called the periciliary liquid layer, and above that sits a, a thicker, sticker, stickier mucus, which entraps particles, and the, the, the cilia clear it all out. Uh, so what happens in cystic fibrosis, if you look down at the bottom right now, um, so the, if you look at the CF picture on the right, you can see that the periciliary liquid layer is now much depleted, and this mucus layer has become thicker and stickier, so now the cilia can't move. And the consequence of that is bacterial infection, inflammation, and a vicious cycle of lung damage. And uh, if you look to the image in the middle on the left, uh, you can see a picture of a, a CF lung. And the, the, the person with the tweezers is pulling out plugs of thick, sticky mucus from the bronchi. And just to the right, you can see uh, on the top, a normal cross-section of a lung, and below that, the cross-section of a CF lung with all the mucus and inflammatory cells. So this is, this is the, uh, the, the physiological problem we're trying to solve and also illustrate some of the barriers that we have to overcome. So one way of looking at this, um, so you can see now why, why, why gene therapy hasn't necessarily been as successful as, as we uh, originally hoped. So in, in thinking of new ways of developing therapeutics for CF, uh, one way we've looked at it is looking at the, at the problem of iron transport. So in one respect, we have the problem of chloride transport. So that's not happening anymore because we've lost the chloride channel. Another consequence of that is that sodium uptake is greatly increased. 
and the consequence of having all this sodium and chloride inside the cells is uptake of water from the surface of the lung. So one, one way of looking at this is to try and restore the home, homeostatic balance of sodium and chloride. If we can get that seesaw level again, so there's a good balance of sodium chloride, we can stop the water loss in the lung, and then potentially uh, we can cure the mucociliary uh, clearance aspect of the disease. So how are we going to do that? Well, there's uh, a, a channel called ENAC, the epithelial sodium channel. It sits in the airway epithelium. And so one approach is to silence the ENAC channel with uh, siRNA. So um, this cartoon is just to show uh, that there are lots of other approaches to the, that we can consider nowadays in addition to the standard therapy of uh, cDNA delivery, uh, which has not worked too well. So nowadays there are, now we know more about the different kinds of mutations that cause cystic fibrosis, and there are something like 200 or more different types of mutation. So there are, for example, approaches that could use oligos for re uh, repair of exon uh, splicing, Messenger RNA therapy, we've heard a, a little ba a, a, about already today, which uh, has a lot of advantages. I'll talk a little bit about that. SIRNA, which I've just mentioned, for targeting ENAC. And uh, something that I don't think has been mentioned yet today is using gene editing, and uh, especially with, now, with CRISPR now on the scene. And this is a, a, a technique or an, a, an approach that particularly plays into the hands, I think, of nanoparticles. Hopefully, uh, we're just starting ourselves in that area, so I haven't got a lot of data, but perhaps if I've got time, I'll um, talk a little bit about that at the end. So, uh, we're very much uh, now, we used to be a, a, a nanoparticle gene therapy group. We're now very much a nanoparticle RNA therapy group, and the reason is the problem of getting genes into the nucleus. So, in non-dividing cells, which is what we're trying to treat in the lung, the nuclear envelope is a, is a huge barrier to getting efficient transfection. So if we're going into the cell, if we can get out of the endosome into the cytoplasm, if we're delivering RNA, whether it be messenger RNA or siRNA, um, that's as far as we need to go, and we can uh, avoid that uh, barrier of the, the nuclear envelope. So, if, so for delivery of... Uh, so going back to the siRNA approach for silencing ENAC, um, we've heard already that we need carriers to get siRNA into cells. So the, the, the approach, uh, I come from a biological background, not a pharmacist or formulation person, so I was interested in trying to mimic, trying to model how viruses or bacteria might get into cells. And we've come up with this nanoparticle system illustrated on the right, and it contains uh, various functionalities that are endowed by a peptide component and lipid components. So first of all, uh, the peptide component contains an oligolysine RNA binding domain, and at the other end of the peptide, separated by a small glycine alanine spacer, is a targeting domain, and um, we're using targeting elements specific for epithelial cells that we pulled out of a phage panning library. So this peptide alone is very good at packaging uh, siRNA into particles, but not a very good transfection agent. But if we add the lipid, then it turbocharges the whole system. And the lipid we're using is one of the oldest known cationic uh, liposome formulations, and that's DOPMA and DOPE. And DOPE in particular turns out in our formulation to be a particularly important component because of its fusogenic properties. It's very good at fusing with endosomal bilayers. So we have this multifunctional nanoparticle that can target receptors on the cell surface, enter the cell by endocytosis, escape from the endosome by lipid fusion with the endosomal bilayer, and hopefully there release the siRNA into the cytoplasm. Um, I'll skip. So briefly, just to show that we've spent many years developing this formulation, 
and we've shown uh, top right that we can deliver by nebulization into the lungs of mice or pigs and express reporter genes. So we see good staining in the trachea and the bronchi uh, in these two species with the, shown by the brown staining. We've shown bottom left that we can nebulize our nanoparticles and achieve good distribution in the lung as shown by uh, imaging by 3D um, scintigraphy. And we're doing a lot of our, um, so, that, so we think animal models are particularly important uh, for uh, looking at delivery, but they're perhaps not telling us what we need to know about the challenges of expression and uh, functionality. And there we're using a human, humanized model, which is human epithelial cells, airway epithelial cells, grown in an air-liquid interface culture, which recapitulates the structure of the lung epithelium. And that, if you grow CF cells, these CF, these CF epithelial cells in alley cultures will produce mucus. They have the electrical properties of a, of a CF lung. So you can do a lot of functional correction studies in the alley culture model. The drawback of it is that it's really difficult to transfect. <laughs> but perhaps that, again, might be telling us something about what's been going on in patients rather than correcting a mouse and giving us false expectations. So uh, one area we've focused on is improving our nanoparticles for mucus penetration. So the mucus is obviously a physical barrier to get through to the airway uh, cells. And you see the diagram on the left that the mucus contains mucin proteins, uh, quite uh, dense uh, web of mucin chains which carry carbohydrates, so they're quite strongly negatively charged. So if you're introducing a cationic nanoparticle, you can see that they might well get caught up in this web of mucins. And so we uh, ingeniously came up with a theory that maybe anionics would work better. Uh, and this turned out to be completely wrong. So you see in my diagram on the right, uh, so this is work done by Aris Tagalakis, who's a senior researcher in my group. And uh, Aris uh, had a, a mucus model and applied fluorescently tagged nanoparticles to the surface of the mucus and then has measured uh, sort of diffusion through the, the mucus. And you can see by the speed of diffusion that actually the cationic pegylated formulation is going fastest. Not far behind it is the non-pegylated cationic and below that, the anionics are lagging behind somewhat. So uh, we haven't actually got a, a specific answer as to why this is so, but uh, we're working on it. But it's an interesting observation that cationics for the lung look to be the way to go. Uh, so what have we done? Uh, I haven't got a lot of data to show on the nanoassembler, but uh, we, we have found that we can formulate peptides and lipids in ethanol. They, so the peptide, uh, fortunately, is very soluble in ethanol. And so then we can, we can do the standard nanoassembler microfluidic mixing with our siRNA in the aqueous phase. And we are able to produce very nice nanoparticles. But I think it's fair to say we've got a bit further optimization to do in getting this uh, firmly reproducible at a scalable level. But it's looking very promising. And just to show that our nano-assembled nanoparticles give very good luciferase transfection in CFBE epithelial cells. So I think there's a lot of promise there with the nano-assembled nanoparticles. Finally, I, I'm getting back to the, the ENAC uh, approach. And so, as I said, we're using siRNA. I don't need to explain how siRNA works here. We formulate our ENAC siRNA into our lipid peptide nanoparticles, add those to the alley cultures, and after an incubation period, then remove them. And then two days later, we do functional studies and molecular studies to see what kind of silencing we're getting. And uh, this is some of the data, and some of it has been distorted, but I'll explain it. So on the left, you see that our transfection top left of messenger RNA analysis, we're getting from a single dose to these alley cultures about 30% knockdown. So as I said earlier, we don't want 100 we want to get that seesaw level, not tipped up the other direction. So 30%, the, 
we, maybe it doesn't sound like it's terribly impressive, but it, is it enough? That's, that's the question. Uh, so on the right, what you're missing there is that we've shown at the protein level that uh, the, the protein is also silenced. Uh, but perhaps more important, the functional studies. So on the left, we've shown electrical correction of the uh, CF epithelial cells. So if you look at the green and the red lines, uh, this is the short circuit current across, uh, measured on an Ussing chamber across that um, airway epithelium. And you see that there's, in the green and the red, and that's controls and untreated, the amylaride response is very strong. So amylaride is also an ENAC blocker. So there's, a, a, there's very strong epith epithelial transport going on, and you can block it with amylaride. But you see that in the siRNA-treated cells, the ENAC amylaride response is greatly reduced by about 50%. Um, another physiological readout we had was that as, as you remember, I proposed that if we knock down ENAC, then that could increase the depth of the fluid layer on top of the airway epithelial cells. And we proposed that that would lead to dilution of the uh, airway surface protein. So we simply collected that fluid and measured protein concentration. And the protein concentration in the siRNA group is also reduced by about 50%. So uh, we're following that at the moment. The question is, is that sufficient? Um, is that restored the homeostatic balance, or do we need further to go? So there's uh, further work to be done there. We've looked at, so um, there are these drugs available, such as amylaride and derivatives, um, that kind of work, but they're very short-lived. So is there a better response from... Uh, um, uh, pharmacodynamic kinetics with siRNA. So on the left, you can see this is in now in a mouse. So we've instilled into the lung single dose, first of all, of uh, the ENAC siRNA, and we're getting about 30% silencing again. Um, if we do three doses, we can improve that silencing down to about 50%. So we can actually modulate the, the, the degree of silencing by repeating the dosing. So if we're doing that, does that modulation persist. So in the graph on the right, we've looked at silencing at two days from a single dose. Again, we've got about 30%. Seven days later, it's uh, at a similar level, even slightly better, but not statistically uh, significant. So it persists for at least seven days, possibly longer. So that's, that suggests that this, is, uh, this could be a, a very viable therapeutic strategy uh, that might reduce the burden of drug taking in uh, therapeutic drugs in CF patients and might help improve their mucociliary clearance. So I think I've actually run out of time. So uh, just briefly, the last thing I'll say, because it's only one slide, is that we have tried messenger RNA as well, because that avoids the uh, barrier to nuclear delivery. And you can see in the, the graph top right, we've improved luciferase expression uh, from the plasmid on the right to the mRNA on the left, which is more than two logs improvement, 100-fold improvement. So that's very promising. The downside is that mRNA doesn't persist for more than about three days with a half-life of seven hours. So there's a question mark over, is that sufficient? So we'll be following up those studies as well. So I haven't got time to talk about CRISPR, but I'm happy to talk to anybody else uh, who's interested after maybe at the coffee break and I'll just finish up with my oops the acknowledgements for my funders and collaborators so thank you very much for listening and I'll try and answer any questions thank you Um, question with, so going after the lung for this application, any thoughts of going systemically? For targeting the lung? Yeah. Um, so our, the target cells we have are the, are the surface epithelial cells. So 
the likelihood of getting across from a blood vessel to the surface epithelium could happen, but it's not likely to be an efficient process. Um, so we, we're not actually looking at that as, a, as an approach with our nanoparticles. Um, we are looking at possibility of using cells that might migrate into the lung, sort of lung stem cells that might know where to go to find their niche in the lung. That's a possibility, but yeah. Um, thank you for the nice talk. And uh, I have one question about the formulation. I know you don't do formulation, but if you know anything, please comment. So uh, have you ever tried the class, I know, uh, the paypad mixing of the formulation? Because in this talk, you were presenting the nano sampler method. So have you ever compared the difference regarding um, chemophysical property and mm. biological properties? Yeah, so yeah, perhaps I've undersold the amount of formulation work we have done. We've, we've done a lot of formulation work, actually. Uh, so all of this work, none of the work I've shown here was nanoassembler uh, formulation, apart from that one transfection. Um, but you know, it's, it, there's obviously the potential there for, for scaling up. So yes, we do uh, look at the, the we've got a, on the nano ZS, we've got size and charge measurement of our nanoparticles to show their cationic charge. Size is 80 to 100 nanometers. Does that answer the question? Does there, was there something else? Oh. With nano assembler and not, no, not yet, no. No, but that'll be very interesting. Yeah, thanks. Is there another one? Yeah, no. Yeah. I have a short <laughs> question on the, the, the penetration of the, those cationic liposomes or lipid nanoparticles uh, in, the, in the mucus. Mm. Have you looked at the, um, the, the mucus viscosity after application? Is it, is it maybe just a, a mucolytic effect? Mm -hmm. uh, so we've, uh, we haven't looked at the effects of our nanoparticles on viscoelastic viscoelasticity. We've, um, we're currently looking at the effects of the treatment two days later on viscoelasticity, but uh, the volume added is, is to the surface of the mucus is very small. I think it's a couple of microliters. Uh, so it's not a dilution effect in any way. It's the same for all the different formulations. So, uh, yes, so, yeah, that's a good theory that it's uh, related to the charge and perhaps removing ions that are maintaining that web and, yeah, maybe opening up the mucus, yeah, in a way we hadn't anticipated. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you.